continue walking through our Passion of Christ series. It's going to come from Luke 24. We take a look at the first 12 verses. If you're using the Pew Bible, you'll find this on page 884. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Luke chapter 24. Again, if you're using the Pew Bible, you can find it on page 884. You know God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of our Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven, and all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, and Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home. Marveling at what happened. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord God, we do come before you this morning. We thank you and praise you that you reveal yourself in a mighty way through your word. And we ask, Lord, you might do that for us this morning. Help us, Lord, to truly see that which you have for us. Make, Lord, the purpose of your resurrection clear to us this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us in a mighty way, that you might remove any and all obstacles that would impede our sight or clog our ears. Lord, I ask it to be with me, your servant. Let no untruths leave my lips, but only the words you have for the building up of your people, the turning of hearts to yourself, and the bringing of glory to your name. For all these things we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Back in 1984, the, way back before Facebook and Amber Alerts and information at your fingertips, there was one company that developed a method of notifying people of missing children. Do you remember the company? Do you remember what they did? See, the company was the Anderson Erickson Dairy. And what they came up with was the idea of placing the faces of missing children on the side of milk cartons. And this took off. They saw this was a great way. And the idea was this. Having the children's missing faces on the milk cartons and enable everyone who was sitting at their breakfast table having their cereal and milk be aware of who they were looking for. And this took off like wildfire. California passed it and made it a statewide program. And then in 1985, the National Child Safety Council, they started their own program called the Missing Kid Milk Carton Program. Unfortunately, though, this program died quickly because pediatricians criticized the idea of having images on the side of milk cartons saying that it induced unwarranted fear in children as they ate their breakfast. Leave it to the experts to ruin a good thing with their unfounded allegations and speculation. See, I think we need to bring the milk carton program back. But let's not put the pictures of missing kids on there. Let's put one picture on there, a picture of an empty tomb. See, this is what we see in our text this morning. We have the first missing persons report. These women and Peter, they go to the tomb, and they find Jesus' body is missing. They don't know what to make of that. But through our text this morning, and through our message, we learn that the empty tomb verifies Jesus' resurrection from the dead, so share his missing persons report. Three things to report are first, a missing person. Second, a need to remember. And third, confused by the obvious. So first, a missing person. 
It's early in the morning. It's on the first day of the week. And we find the women who were last to leave the cross are now the first to be found at the tomb. But you need to know something here. The reason that they're at the tomb was the wrong reason. They went there looking to find the body of Jesus. Look at verse 1 what it says. They went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. You'll recall how on Good Friday they left the tomb. They went home to prepare their spices and their ointments so they could return and complete the burial process. So here they are. The day after the Sabbath. They rested on the Sabbath, and now they're up early in the morning, first thing, and they're running to the tomb because they want to complete what they started. But there's a problem. They're up early, the sun is risen, and they're at the tomb. But the body they're seeking to prepare, it's not there. And this is because they wrongly assumed that Jesus would still be in the tomb. Verse 2 tells us, what they found was a stone rolled away, but they didn't find the body. What we have here is a case of a missing person. But like all missing person cases, there are always clues that help us ascertain what's taking place. If you walk into a house and find broken furniture and things strewn all about, and a purse left behind with ID in it, then the person's probably missing because they were forcibly removed. But if you walk in and nothing's been disturbed, and the wallet's missing, and the bank account's been cleared out, then that person probably just ran away. See, the clues tell you what's going on. And in the same way, we have clues here that tell us what's going on. The first clue is the stone has been rolled away. This tells us there's one of two things that happened. Either some people came from outside and rolled the stone away and took the body, or the body inside just left. If we look at Matthew 27, we see that guards were posted outside the tomb, making it highly unlikely that anybody came and overpowered these guards, rolled away the tomb, and secreted away the body. What we have here is clearly an inside job. See, there's no signs of forced entry, and nothing inside has been disturbed. And our next clue that we see is found in verse 3, where we read, that they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. See, this is significant. As the designation, that word Lord, it signifies his resurrection. It's by his resurrection that Jesus is declared to be Lord. We see this in Acts 2.36, where Luke announces that God has made him both Lord and Christ. The missing body hasn't been taken away, but it's been raised. And if this doesn't solve the case for you, if you're still thinking, no, there's got to be more evidence, then move forward to verses 5 and 6. Look what you see there. You see how these two angels show up, and they gently rebuke these women. They ask him this question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? See, the angels are mildly scolding the women, as if to say, come on, you know what he said, you know what he told you, you know what he said about his death, his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection. See, what you have here is the angels reminding the women of what Jesus said and asking them, why are you doubting his words? Just as he told you, he isn't here, but is risen. What you have is an eyewitness account of the missing person. Just as Jesus told you, he isn't here, but has risen. Case closed. Jesus isn't missing at all, but Jesus Christ, your Lord, has risen from the dead. I want you to think about Jesus as a missing person. He wasn't in the tomb because he was bodily raised from the dead. He's alive. This is an actual fact. And we don't mean by this that somehow he's living on in our hearts, minds, or memories. You know how people say, oh, you'll never be forgotten. You'll live forever in my mind and my heart. This sounds so wonderful, so warm and fuzzy, until you really step back and start thinking about it. You realize at some point in your life, there'll be nobody who remembers you. 
You ought to be long gone. No hearts to live on in. But that's not the case with Jesus. He lives on because he was actually bodily raised from the dead. Amen. Jesus said he would rise from the dead, and his words were confirmed by the empty tomb. The appearances to the women, to the disciples, to the apostles, and even to 500 other people, just as Paul lays out for us in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. You can believe that Jesus rose from the dead, and not just because of the empty tomb or all the post-resurrection appearances, but you can believe it because he said it would happen. Amen. You can trust what Jesus says. Amen. If Jesus says it, then you know it's true. Amen. You can take your missing persons report and file it under case closed because Jesus Christ has been found. He rose from the dead and sits on high in his heavenly throne beside his heavenly father. Amen, amen. The women see a missing person, but they quickly learn that Jesus is found. And this brings us to our second point, a need to remember. See, these women at first are perplexed by this empty tomb. That is until the angels reminded them. Verses 6 and 7, look what it says here. Remember how he told you while I was still in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and on the third day rise. See, this angel simply remind these women of Jesus' words. And this is so important for us, because it reminds us of our need to remember Jesus' words as well. Just think, how many times has God delivered you from some hardship or difficulty? And how many passages of Scripture lay out for you... God's promises to care for you always. But we're prone to for, you know, forget. We're quick to forget. Why do you think God went and wrote his word down for us? Recorded it for us? Because he knows how quick we are to forget. See, God gives us his Bible to help us remember. Just think of this. Think about when it's on Wednesday and somebody says to you, what was the sermon about on Sunday? And you go, Sunday? That was like three days ago, man. I can't remember that. You know how far ago that was? Can't remember that. But think about all the things we do remember. Things like, who didn't say hello to you last week? Or who let you down last year? Or what your husband didn't do last decade? We remember these things, but what we need to remember is what we see right here. We need to remember God's word. And I want you to notice what happens when these women remember. It immediately changes their perspective and influences what they do. Verses 8 and 9 say, And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. These women remembered, and they immediately went and shared these things with others. What these women are doing is they're seeking to help others remember as well. This is why they go to the eleven, that is the apostles, and to the rest, that is the other disciples. They went to the people that Christ himself spoke these very words to. You get that? They didn't go first into the world. They went first to Christ's people who worked with, with, with him, who walked with him, who traveled with him. The people who should have remembered. And why do they do this? Because once again, we're quick to forget. And again, we see why it's so important to remember. Because if we forget, then we live in despair. These women were lamenting the loss of Jesus. The apostles were cowering in their closets. And the disciples were all wondering what happened. How could their Savior... The one in whom they placed their hope and their trust. How could he now be dead? What was going to happen with them? These thoughts were all because they didn't remember what Jesus had told them when he walked among them. And we do likewise. We do the same thing whenever we fail to remember God's word. And just think about what it is that they failed to remember. 
that Jesus rose from the dead. This is pretty big news. You'd think this would be something kind of hard to forget. I mean, think about big events in your life and how you remember them. I bet that everyone here remembers their birthday and probably remembers your kids' birthdays as well. Pretty big thing to forget, right? So you would think the same thing with the disciples. Jesus told them he would rise from the dead. So how could they forget that? Well, before you get too hard on the disciples, just think about how today you have it so much better than them because you have the Holy Scriptures, God's Word, fully written down and accessible to you. And knowing this, ask yourself, how often do you still fail to remember that Christ rose from the dead? See, you do this every time you allow some temporary infliction, hardship, or difficulty to take all your focus and to take your focus off of Christ. You do this whenever you look at life as though it's bleak and there's nothing to look forward to. You do this whenever you allow the problems of life to steal the joy of the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, today is Resurrection Sunday and Christ has risen. Do you get this? He's alive. Amen. Do you get this? He's alive. Amen. He rose from the dead. Hallelujah. And we're not talking about when Frankenstein says it's alive. We're talking about your Lord and Savior who said he would rise from the dead, and he did. He lives on today. Amen. This is why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that if Christ hasn't been raised, then we are all people to be pitied. But we're not to be pitied because Christ did rise and he lives on. This is what you need to remember. Mm -hmm. Doing this will change your perspective and change your life. You'll now be like these women. You'll be able to go forth and tell all the world that he has risen. That will be on your minds and coming out of your mouth, Dale. Not just on Easter morning, but every day that we tell people, He has risen. He's alive and lives on. Don't forget that Christ isn't missing, but He's been raised to heaven. And this will keep you thinking clearly, which brings us to our third point. Confused by the obvious. The women, they share this good news with the apostles and the disciples, but as verse 11 says, these words seem to them a tale, an idle tale, and they didn't believe them. It's interesting here because the Greek used for the term idle tale, it's actually a medical term that refers to wild words that come out of someone's mouth who's suffering with delirium. Put differently, these apostles and disciples were looking at these women like they were crazy. Like they were out of their minds. And the interesting thing about this is, all these women said was precisely what Jesus himself had said when he was with the same disciples and apostles who are now doubting it. This is so interesting to think about, too. Think about these women who are coming to the apostles and disciples. They're not just any women. These are women who went out with and lived among Jesus and his disciples and apostles. These were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James. The designation of their names here, what that's doing for you, is showing their prominence. Telling you that they were well known. These were women that could be trusted. Yet, the very apostles who Jesus spoke these same words to, who knew these women so well, they now look at them like they're crazy. See, this is sort of like when your pastor preaches something to you that comes right from the scriptures. You know, like when he says these wild and crazy things like, you're supposed to be in worship every Lord's Day. You're supposed to be tithing every week. You hear these things, and you think, he's crazy. He's got to be out of his mind. He's off his rocker. I don't believe these things. Next thing you know, this guy's going to be telling me I'm supposed to be spending the whole Lord's Day in the public and private worship of God. That's insane, isn't it? He's got to be out of his mind. But it comes right from Scripture. 
That's what God's word tells us. Just like he tells us that he rose from the dead. Why do you believe that and not believe the rest? Believe all of God's word. That's why he gives it to us. See, the problem isn't with the lack of clarity in the scriptures, but it's how we're so easily confused by the obvious. Just think about Peter. Think about how he walked with Jesus, told Jesus, I will die for you if I have to. And yet he doubts. But not entirely. Notice he does something. He runs to the tomb to check it out for himself. Is it really true? Is his body really gone? And he gets to the tomb, and he finds it empty, just as the women said. But what does he do? He stoops down and looks in, and he finds the linen cloths by themselves. And what does this do? This causes him to go home marveling or wondering about what just happened. You get this? Peter was plainly told by Jesus in Mark 8, 31 to 33, that he must suffer, die, and three days later rise from the dead. The women had told him, hey, it's happened. He rose from the dead. Peter himself sees a missing body, and he goes home confused. Add to this the fact that it's been three days since Jesus was laid in the tomb, and what you have is a case of the obvious. You say to yourself, how could anybody miss this? Clearly what's happened here is Jesus rose from the dead just as he said. But Peter's still confused by the obvious. And this shouldn't surprise us, and it also should give us great comfort. This is because we see again how much better we have it today because we have the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, in Peter and the apostles' defense, they didn't yet have the Spirit dwelling them. That would come 50 days later at Pentecost. But we have the Spirit dwelling us now. At the moment of our conversion, we have that spirit wrought union where the Spirit of Christ indwells us. So we're so blessed today. You realize that? That you were so blessed today because Jesus has risen, and because he's risen, he sent his counselor, the Holy Spirit, to guide and direct all your ways. You don't need to be confused by the obvious because you've got God's word written down for you. Just pick it up and read it. Amen. And you've got the ability to go to God in prayer and ask the Spirit to reveal these things to you, to make them clear to you. See, this Holy Spirit, it's sort of like these angels appearing to these women. See, the women were so sure of what was going on because these angels, God's messenger said to them, here's what's going on, just like he told you he rose from the dead. Well, in the same way, You've got God's spirit to basically clear up any confusion for you. If you want to understand anything, then open up your Bibles, read them, and pray for the spirit to make things clear to you. Amen. Oh, it'll be an eye-opening experience. Amen. Try and do that. Say, you know what? I'm going to do something this Easter, and I'm going to tarry it through all the way through May. I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to pray before I read it, ask God to show me what's in it, and follow what it says. Amen, amen. Another important lesson from this obvious confusion we see is that just like Peter and the apostles were out were without the Holy Spirit, you know who else was without the Holy Spirit? Unbelievers. Mm -hmm. This is what explains to you why things of faith seem so confusing to them. This explains to you why things that seem so obvious to you are so confusing to them. And this tells you the importance of sharing God's word and praying for it to be effective. God sends his spirit to work with his word. Prayer must accompany the sharing of the word. Like a married man without his wife is the word without prayer. You need to pray and you need to have people praying for and with you. Amen. You know a key component of evangelism is prayer? Wow. I hate it when people say, I can't do evangelism, it's too hard. Well, can you pray? Because if you can pray, you can do evangelism. Because that's a key component of evangelism. Amen. And we often miss this point. 
But ask yourself this question. Why do you think in our bulletin we now have salvific prayer for souls? Because we have loved ones that we want to pray for and we want to see them come to saving faith. And so we're asking you to pray with us and pray for them. And not just on Sunday morning, but every day of the week. Do you have enough time to do that? To pray that someone might come to know the Lord and Savior? Brothers and sisters, don't be ashamed to share Christ with your unsaved family, friends, or loved ones. And don't be ashamed to share with your church that you have family members, friends, and loved ones that don't know Christ. Put them on our salvific prayers for souls. What better way to come together as the body of Christ than actually to lift up our loved ones together? And what better way to grow Christ's church than to share his word, pray that it's effective, and watch as it accomplishes its purpose with which it goes out? What greater joy is there than to tell someone that Jesus has risen and watch as God transforms their heart and raises them to newness of life? Don't let people be confused by the obvious, but clarify their confusion by sharing Christ and praying that the Holy Spirit will enlighten their minds, renew their wills, and turn them to everlasting life in Jesus Christ. And again, if you know someone, someone you truly love and care about, then add them to our salvific prayer for souls. Let's not be ashamed to pray people into salvation. This morning, we received a missing persons report. But unlike most missing persons report, this one brings us the greatest news there ever could be. The greatest news of all time. That Jesus Christ isn't missing at all, but that he's risen from the dead. Hallelujah. He's not missing, he's just changed his address. No longer is in Bethlehem of Judea, but now he resides in his throne in heaven. Sitting behind, beside his heavenly father. And this is what Easter is all about. Jesus' resurrection from the dead in fulfillment of the very words he spoke. On Easter morning, the world looks around and they see family and bunnies and peace. But this picture is missing a key ingredient. It's missing Christ who is missing from the grave. Think of it like a puzzle. You know how you do the big, huge jigsaw puzzles? And they seem to have that one key centerpiece. Not the one that's on the bottom of the branch or one on top of the, you know, the sky or the cloud. That key piece that without it, you've got the puzzle finished, but it's distorted, not clear. Don't let the world be like that. See, because when you have any Easter celebration without Christ, then what you have is a puzzle missing a key piece. And this is what you have in a world without Christ. And this is what you have in a life without Christ. Don't try and put the pieces of life together without the key piece, that central piece, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let him be front and central and bring the whole perfect picture together uh -huh. and let it shine before everyone. All right. Show all around you Christ mm -hmm. by how you live. Amen. Let everyone you know and love around you Walk having all the pieces because you've shared Christ with them. Mm -hmm. Tell them about Christ with the words you speak. And again, let them see Christ as they see the life that you live. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Let's put Jesus' face back at the breakfast table mm -hmm. across this land. Yeah. Let's have him front and center at our breakfast tables, our lunch tables, and our dinner tables. Mm -hmm. Let's have his face staring at everyone as they eat their morning cereal and milk. Come on. Let it be known to everyone that he has risen. Yes. Let me say that again. Let it be known to everyone that he Hallelujah. has risen. Hallelujah. And remember, the empty tomb verifies Jesus' yes. resurrection from the dead. So go and share his missing persons report. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord God, we do come before you. We thank you and praise you, Lord, that you have risen. Just as you said, just as you told your disciples and your apostles, just as you told these women who visited your tomb, Lord, that you would rise, you did so. 
You showed, Lord, that you were truly the Savior of the world, accomplishing that which you were sent out to do by conquering the grave, conquering sin and death, and living on. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this. And we praise you, Lord, for your spirit, your spirit that indwells us, enables us to live on with you. Lord, help us to go forth. Even, Lord, as we go about our Easter celebrations, as we sit around tables with those that we love, those that we know, and those that know not Christ, let us let it be known to all that Christ has risen. For we ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.